Hey, what's up? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Periodic Table. I am, of course, your host, Brandon Hanna. You might know me. I'm a mechanical engineer. You might have seen me hosting things and stuff over at AfterBuzz TV and the Popcorn Talk Network, or even over as a hitman in the movie trivia Schmodown. I had to think about how I wanted to say that. Normally, I say I'm mischievous, <laughs> but sometimes I don't think that quite meets the description. But speaking of someone who is very mischievous, um, ooh, I almost forgot to pull up his credibility because I want to make sure because he is a very credible fella. He is a musician, associate producer at the Shmoda Entertainment Network. There's that connection. And he is a quote unquote math boy. It is Alex Marzonia. It is I. Brandon, you look Woo! great today. Your hair looks amazing. Oh, thank you. You look very good. Johnny as well. Hello. Hi. We're all just we're all just good science friends, good science boys today. Good science friends, it. good science boys, and of course, speaking of good friends and boys, um, you might know him. He is a filmmaker, co-host of the First View podcast, and video editor and writer for Geeks of Color. It is Jonathan Rome. Welcome. Hi, Brandon. You look incredible. Your hair is amazing, and Alex, I love your spirit. Thank you, Johnny. Oh. You look great too. I'm sorry that that. <laughs> <laughs> let's just go on about this. Let's let's tell each other sorry. how much you love each other. This yeah, great. can this just be like us holding hands <laughs> from far away? Five minutes of us holding hands, <laughs> telling each other how much we love one yeah. another. That's I think, you know, goes, yeah. I I've been watching a lot of TikTok lately, and there's like oh. uh, like science scientists who look really good and are sharing their knowledge with everybody on TikTok while looking really good. And Brandon, honestly, you should get on that because mm -hmm. uh, your hair is fire right now. Your glasses are fire, everything, man. It's a love fest today. Thank you. You know, I, di I do feel like I'm having a weird hair day, but I'm making the best of it. I was, you know, toying with it a lot before the show. Recently took a shower because I wanted to be clean and alert and ready to go for today's episode. And what an episode we have here today. Um, let's go over some of these topics. A new catalyst turns greenhouse gas into jet fuel. I think that is really cool. We also have ultra precise lasers remove cancer cells without damaging nearby tissue. There's a little bit of positivity there um, with a very serious topic. Can't wait to dive into that. And I thought this one would be funny. We do have a special segment, of course, for you all today, which I have titled, What a Load of Crap. <laughs> Why do wombats poop cubes? We're going to be talking about it because scientists may have found the answer. But before we get into all that BS, let's hop all the way back up to the top and let's talk about this new catalyst turning greenhouse gas into fuel. So guys, airplanes pump a lot of carbon dioxide or <laughs> CO2, if you're looking at the periodic table elements, uh, into Earth's atmosphere. That waste, which is a greenhouse gas, contributes to global warming. But someday, CO2 instead could be sucked from the air and used to power those planes. Air travel currently makes up 12% of all transit-related CO2 emissions, according to this article here. And using CO2 instead of oil to make jet fuel could reduce the air travel industry's carbon footprint, which I think is very exciting. And of course, guys, links to all the articles we talk about are in the description down below. I'm going to throw it over to Johnny first. Johnny, what do you think about using carbon dioxide instead of oil to make jet fuel and its implications in the airline industry and reducing our overall carbon footprint? Well, Brandon, I'm I'm all about reducing carbon footprints. I mean, that's just that's that's my jam. Um, as someone who doesn't drive, not out of the fear of driving, <laughs> um, totally not out of the fear of just driving, but <laughs> out of wanting to reduce my carbon footprint. Um, no, I uh, I think that it, it's awesome to take these uh, very necessary steps um, in the right direction towards combating uh, global warming, because that's that's just something that every year becomes more and more evident, um, uh, uh, you know, with with all these crazy climate things going on. Um, and uh, and I, I just I the, the way the article just so tenderly and sexily just talked about uh, 
uh, um, uh, how catalysts break apart. Um, uh, would, would the the catalyst would then break apart uh, carbon dioxide into separate molecules, and then the carbon would go and hang out with the hydrogen a bit, and that would that would essentially be what um, what I believe is fueling is is turning into jet fuel. Um, that is awesome. I, I just I, I love uh, chemical compounds and and uh, the deconstruction of molecules. Um, but yes, I do think that this is a very necessary step forward. Um, considering how much everyone just airline travels when there's no global panini going on. Yeah, exactly. And very well put. You know, it is important, I believe, and as Alex also kind of alluded to, to make science sexy. And that's what we're trying to do here. And I think between the three of us, we're doing a pretty darn good job. But let's throw it over to you, Alex. Now, what were your overall thoughts on this article? Um, are you excited about the the possibilities of this catalyst turning CO2 into jet fuel. Yeah, I mean, as Johnny was saying, it, it'll be great to get all those to, to at least slow down global warming and all the carbon emissions. And uh, a bigger step, of course, would be to, you know, completely take out coal, oil, all that stuff from emitting carbon dioxide. But this is a great first step to at least reduce that. First of all, I don't think people should be traveling right now, um, but uh, hey, if, it, if this will help, then I'm all for it. So let's do it now. Yeah, let's do Get it them now, out of there. guys. Get let's do it now. <laughs> well, scientists have actually apparently tried to convert CO2 into jet fuel before, but those efforts relied on catalysts made of costly materials, and the process took many steps. However, this new catalyst is a powder made up of cheap ingredients such as iron, and it converts CO2 into jet fuel in one single step, uh, which I think is a very key takeaway. A lot of scientific advancements, new technology can be hindered because of their cost effectiveness, um, how complicated the process is, how many resources and manpower you have to throw into making something possible. So I'm sure scientists uh, many years ago were able to successfully in one way or another convert CO2 into fuel, but now they've finally figured out a way to do it cost effectively um with as little resources and manpower as possible which i think is uh really cool and so <laughs> johnny let's throw it over back to you was there anything else in particular that stood out to you in this article are you excited about these poss possibilities um and also just like if you have any overall closing thoughts on the importance of in general of reducing our carbon footprint and being aware of climate change i want to hear it all throw it you hear me. it all oh, finally finally the people in my life don't let me talk about carbon footprints enough um <laughs> no i mean again i'm i'm uh i as as someone who's very excited um to to do a lot of traveling when i when i get past the age of 21 uh, uh and and of course when the pandemic dies down um I, I'd like to know that that with the amount of people traveling, there's there's not as as heavy that of, of a carbon footprint as as Alex uh, talked about 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 eliminating coal and oil and uh, and we know how hard that's going to be because a lot of that is also driven by money and and uh, and and finances and whatnot. But um, but this is a great step in a necessary direction, and the fact that they're able to make it. Um, to make this catalyst out of such cheap materials to to kind of dilute that argument of, oh, well, it's too expensive to make these catalysts because rah, 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 rah. Um, I guess the next step is, is well, can we actually integrate it? Um, and that's going to be the, the next thing we watch out for uh, because now we know that it is possible uh, with cheap materials. Uh, you said it was a way, the article says it's a one-step uh, process of turning that CO2 um, into, into the necessary jet fuel over, over oil. Um, the next step is seeing how we can integrate it, if we can integrate it, or if, um, if what that might mean for the oil industry for, for uh, within airlines, uh, what that might mean financially, if that would be more important to, to certain airlines. Um, but I guess honestly, it's, it's, it's a, it's a time will tell situation, but, um, but Hey, I'm all about 
producing the carbon footprint over over time and um and yeah everyone go get a prius <laughs> yes everyone go get a prius i think it's safe to say although it's going to be a slow and agonizing process the oil fossil fuel industry is slowly on its way out and it needs to be replaced with new industries uh new ways of cleaner, safer, renewable energies. And this, I think, is a very creative way to go about it. What, what's really going on here, um, according to the article, is they're taking the CO2 molecules and removing the, separating the carbon and the oxygen, and then taking the carbon and infusing it with hydrogen molecules. And this combination is what um, creates the fuel, the fuel and the leftover oxygen atoms also join up with hydrogen atom, atoms to form water which is great. I love water. I've got some water right now. Oh, me too. <laughs> hey, what Very are you drinking? Alex? Uh, I got some coffee. It's still oh, oh. Well, yeah. it's made of water though, right? It is. It is. There you go. Coffee drink. infused with the water. Guys, this is a very just what well, this really is, is a strenu strenuous process of taking carbon dioxide and turning it into coffee, which I think <laughs> is what is really going on here. But no, in, in all seriousness, uh, there's there's a last little paragraph here in this article, which I think is particularly interesting and, and brings up a, a good point, I think, is that um, we have a chemist at the University of Oxford in English. Uh, his team uh, tested this new catalyst on the, the CO2 in a small reaction chamber, and the chamber was set to 300 degrees Celsius, and it was also pressurized to about 10 times the air pressure at sea level which I think is particularly interesting. And over 20 hours, the catalyst converted more than one third of the CO2 into chemical products. And about half of that uh, was jet fuel hydrocarbons. And the rest of it was just other chemicals. But you'd think, oh no, like chemical waste. But what they can actually do with these other chemicals is use them to make plastics. So obviously plastics, not the best for the environment. Um, we know there's a lot of it floating around in the ocean, in landfills. It doesn't really biodegrade particularly well. But if it's, if you know, we, we are going to have, hopefully we cut down on our single use plastics as a, as a society uh, significantly going forward. But I feel like there's always going to be a use for some plastics in our day-to-day -day lives, in our technologies and in our infrastructure, there's always going to be some sort of use for plastic. And if it can be a byproduct of a process like this, which overall reduces our carbon footprint and it's not created through a manufacturing process that increases our carbon footprint, I think this is another kind of like low-key takeaway from this 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 process this new catalyst where now we're also using it to create plastics in a more carbon friendly carbon neutral friendly way than we are currently because in one way shape or form plastic is still going to be something that we use to 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 build with and make materials with even going forward um so alex I would like to throw this over to you now. Do you have any other closing thoughts on this article? And are, are you with me? Do you think that this plastic takeaway is also something to be seriously looked at as a potential way of reducing our carbon footprint, not just in the jet fuel industry, but in the plastic uh, manufacturing process as well? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, uh, plastics clearly aren't going away. Uh, so the if we can make them in a more environmentally friendly way, that's I'm all for that. Um, recycling helps a little bit. Uh, so um, keep on keep on recycling, and now we can reduce all the carbon emissions from that. Um, but I did want to ask. Uh, so it, it the resulting a hydrogen hydrocarbon mo molecules can serve as jet fuel. Does that mean that all of the planes have to get a new thing installed to, um, you know, use that fuel? Or is that, you think it's built into the fuel? I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like, no, that's is, a it, yeah. is it more, will that be another expense that kind of negates that? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's a good question because you look at like uh, motor vehicles, right? You know, different types of engines require different types of fuel. If you want like a more like high octane fuel, uh, your engine needs to be designed a certain way to to run it, um, to burn it off cleanly and safely, well, cleanly in quotes, but <laughs> clean as, as far as the inside of the engine <laughs> and how it makes sure nothing gets stuck together and mucked up together. Um, but and also, you know, or if you have like a car that like runs on like ethanol or something like that, or like, you know, like, like oil, you know, there's, there's people that have cars and little motorbikes that can run on leftover grease from restaurants from like fry oil, stuff like that. And so all those different engines have to be retrofitted in different ways. So I think this is a very good point. My initial assumption was that there would be little to none modifications to these engines to 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 run on this carbon based fuel um but i'm not entirely sure that's a really good question to raise because if we have to now manufacture a lot of new airline engines uh that's good for companies like the pratt and whitney's out there who are like hey we get to make more engines but uh is that what does that do as far as wastes and adding to to the cost and all that stuff. So, uh, Johnny, did you have any uh, additional thoughts on that? Do you agree with what Alex's concerns are? No, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great question that I I, I honestly wasn't even thinking about. Um, but when we talk about like um, cost effectiveness and and that being a very loud point to uh, to a lot of these airline manufacturers, um, that is a great that is a great question to to raise. You know. Um, but would it be, you know, but I, I also, um, I think as much as, as money speaks, I, I think that, um, social, you know, just, just, just people, um, are starting because of, of Twitter and because of, of, uh, being able to voice, uh, concerns about these kinds of things and how, how big an issue, uh, global warming is for a lot of people. Um, perhaps it's an expense that, that airlines are willing to take. Um, for the sake of publicity, for the sake of, oh, well, Spirit Airlines Airlines has, uh, what, 75% of their airlines are running on this new catalyst. Well, maybe that's, uh, that's more enticing for people to use Spirit Airlines over something like American or Delta, barring the fact that American and Delta have terrible customer service. But um, uh, <laughs> well, we just but, lost um, a few sponsors. Sorry, Brandon. Oh yeah, sorry, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the periodic table, Brandon Hanna, brought to you by Spirit Airlines. Uh, <laughs> But no, I, I think um, I think that's a that's an excellent question to poise, and uh, and I'm curious to see if um, if just societal, uh, just people, you know, the the consumers' uh, views are going to uh, be as effective um, in in making that decision as money is. Yeah, I think those are some really good points, and you you know you brought up the are they willing to just like take this hit of manufacturing these new engines for the publicity for people potentially buying new tickets. And also like it got me thinking, what is the lifespan of an engine uh, on an aircraft? If it's properly maintenance, properly taken care of a single uh, engine on a commercial airline uh, could, could last a relatively long time. Um, definitely years. So whereas this fuel has to be constantly manufactured, constantly produced. So it's it's a matter of this one thing that's going to last a long time is a new expense, but it's a solid investment towards the future because we are going to be potentially saving money on fuel. But then how does this new fuel compete with the cost of oil? Oil is probably still significantly cheaper. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done. But I, I, I like to, to think, have hope and optimism in the industry and humanity that we will make active efforts to pursue cleaner, more carbon friendly, carbon footprint friendly uh, ways of uh, living in general. Um, so with all that being said, I just want to take a look at the live chat right here. We have BCD. We have somebody named Marzonia in the chat. I wonder who that could be. Um, Haskell420 and Sabrina Ramirez. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. Um, love having you all here every week. Um, please, if you guys are watching, like this video, uh, leave a comment down below. 
uh, subscribe to this channel, hit that little notification bell if you don't want to miss another episode of the periodic table because every single week I'm coming at you with some awkward humor, some bad hair days, and some amazing guests. And I hope you are all uh, willing to join me on the ride that is science. I don't know what I'm saying. Let's move on to our next topic, <laughs> which is ultra precise closing. lasers remove cancer cells without damaging nearby tissue. So right off the bat, this seems like a pretty serious topic, but something that could be optimistic. So a new laser system that could help surgeons remove cancer more precisely and safely is being developed by scientists. Experts at the Harriet Watt University, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's another thing you can expect from me on a weekly basis <laughs> with pronunciations. In Edinburgh, uh, are developing a new system that will help surgeons distinguish cancer cells in much better resolution and remove them without damaging healthy surrounding tissue. Um, the new system will be based around ultra-fast picosecond lasers that deliver energy in a series of pulses that are one trillionth of a second long. Um, and this is a technology that can be used for treatment on brain, head, and neck cancers. I know it says here um, in the article that the concept has already been proven to work for colorectal cancer. Um, and they're now working with um, people uh, at universities and hospitals to develop this new system specifically for brain cancers. So this is a lot to, to digest, a lot to unravel. Alex, I want to throw it over to you first. What was your overall impression on this article? Um, were you at all familiar with this technology as they say it already uh, existed in some degree to treat colorectal cancer? And do you think um, going forward, this is something that we can be optimistic about, a cancer treatment that we can really um, look to, toward um, to, to really be a commonly used safe practice to benefit the lives of people who unfortunately do suffer from brain cancer and uh, related illnesses. Yeah, I didn't know about this technology before, but I mean, we, I'm glad that it, they're expanding their um, breadth of different types of cancers that they can hopefully uh, eliminate from someone's body. Uh, as we're all are we, everybody has been affected. Everybody knows someone who's been affected with cancer at some point in their lives. Um, of course we have Kevin Smith's smash cancer. Um, uh, we were hoping the best for him. And I, this, this technology is pretty cool. Um, I just Pico, what is it? Um, ultra fast picosecond lasers that develop energy in a series of pulses that are one trillionth of a second long. It's just like thinking that small is just pretty, uh, it's mind blowing. But uh, there's this part here in this article, it says this is an ultimate test of precision. Even microscopic loss of healthy tissue and damage to nearby vital structures can have severe functional consequences and a huge impact on quality of life. So it's very, you have to be very precise with this kind of technology or else you can screw up uh, the future for the, that person. Uh, so it's, you have to be very careful with that kind of stuff. But overall optimistic, I'm, I'm an optimistic boy. So let's, uh, let's get this technology developed so we can uh, help cure cancer, more uh, cancers. Yeah, this is, this is an optimistic show in general. And you know, speaking of which, it says here that the laser pulses are so short that there's no time for heat to burn surrounding tissue, and which they say is what happens with current surgical surgical tools. So if this is something that they can perfect, it seems like it can be something that is relatively safe, a laser pulse that can destroy a tumor, but not damage surrounding tissue, which is, um, you know what we know happens with current cancer treatments, you just kind of attack everything and patients really suffer because of that, because to, to remove the tumor, you got to almost attack the entire body, the entire surrounding area. And it's quite the battle and quite, quite the struggle. So for me, looking at this, um, even if this doesn't increase the amount of 
cancer survivors if it can somehow ease their suffering while they're going through these treatments and make the treatments less painful, less strenuous on the body. I think that um, that is a win no matter what. So Johnny, let's throw it over to you. Did anything in particular stand out to you in this article and what were your overall thoughts? Um, yeah, no, this is definitely um, an interesting development in, in that world. And as, as Alex said, uh, uh, you know, we all know someone um, who, who has been affected uh, by, by cancer in some way. Um, and uh, it's, <laughs> I mean, uh, look, the concepts of, of uh, laser, laser surgery have, have always been very scary to me, um, especially, you know, after, after Final Destination 5. Um, but of course, of course, that being a fictional movie, uh, you know, is... Or is um, it? Well, no, Anyways. Not Final <laughs> Destination 5. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but, um, but everything I'm reading about this laser and, and the development of it and what uh the success it's had and what success it's it's striving for is it, again it, it's i'm also optimistic so i i am optimistic that this is going to make huge strides um in the community uh in, in um in uh in just safely and and securely and precisely uh removing cancer cells um of course cancer is something that has just you know affected so many people throughout decades and decades and decades and and um and uh it's terrifying um so to be shown these rays of hope uh no no pun intended with rays but to be shown these these rays of hope uh through scientific developments um it's a it's a beautiful thing and i i really hope it does work out um of course it, it is in development right now um, you know, what could that mean cost wise? What could that, what's the timeline on that? You know, that kind of thing, but everything they're saying about, um, about the precision, the safety and letting that be the forefront of it as it should be. Um, it's, 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 it's awesome. And I'm very excited to see how this could, how this could, uh, positively curve, um, uh, cancer surgery, um, in the future. Yeah, certainly. Um, and you know, it says here, it reiterates just how the importance of not damaging surrounding healthy tissue, they say even a microscopic loss um, to, to nearby vital structures can have severe consequences in the impact of quality of life of cancer patients. So if, if this is something that they can perfect uh, going forward, it, this this could be something that is monumental as far as cancer treatments are concerned. Um, and they also say here that the team will focus on developing a flexible optical fiber-based system that can target and remove cancer cells two orders of magnitude smaller than the current technology. And this is over the next three years. So this is an amazing stepping stone um, that to use these optical fibers or two orders of magnitude smaller than what they currently have. So um, that probably in, in terms of, cause they, cause they also reiterate that you have to remove all the cancer cells. If there are some cancer cells that are really difficult to remove um, on the current system, something two magnitudes smaller um, could, that could be life-saving uh, going I feel, forward. I feel like Alex, what, I feel like thoughts? D would you rather have them focusing on the main thing first or even go, going even smaller? That's like my thing with that. And also it says, we'll also focus on developing this, but also they were given uh, 1.2 million pounds to develop the system. And it's like, is like 75% going to the, the, the smaller, the, the more micro one we just mentioned or the, the main one. Like that's what, that's what I'm, concerned about like when you're developing two things at the same time you know like where does the focus go Great point. yeah definitely i think that's uh, a really valid concern um i feel like they can probably simultaneously work on both along the way i like to think that it won't impede their ability to really perfect their primary uh goal if because because if it, it seems to me that maybe you know while they're they're focusing on making this technology 
um, viable for brain cancer treatments, maybe as they're doing that, they realize that they can use the current technology on colorectal cancer, but they can make changes to the to the way they're doing it, the size of the fibers, and um, treat colorectal cancer more precisely while they're also working towards brain cancer. Maybe that is what is kind of going on here. It's a little hard to say. Uh, the article only tells us so much, but I think that's that's the point of this show really is to, to have these conversations, to have this open dialogue, to learn about these topics together, but also raise more questions. Um, and that's really, uh, I think, important as uh, Alex even outlined the last time he was on this show is like having that public awareness. And if we can help contribute to that in any way, maybe this inspires someone else to maybe or inspires one of us to, to raise more questions, do a little more research uh, and see what uh, what is really going on, what this technology is really about. So I think that is also a key takeaway. I wish I had all the answers. <laughs> I unfortunately don't. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Brennan, last time I was here, I was also, I also uh, pitched a Chris Nolan movie. Are there any ways we can pitch a Nolan movie for any, either of these stories so far? <laughs> <laughs> like Ant-Man going into in, in, Chris I Nolan. <laughs> Oh my gosh. In, in, in the future, uh, carbon dioxide based jet fuel is as good as gold. Um, so these wealthy entrepreneurs from the future uh, travel, uh, send agents back in time to grab carbon dioxide to convert to jet fuel in the future. Uh, Tenet 2. Oh, or maybe there's no that. more there's no more carbon dioxide at all. They like all these jet fuel, you know, uh, like have converted all the carbon dioxide. So they need, and like, wait, no, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I would <laughs> I would love if, if, I would love if the catalysts are 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 like Rick and Morty style, where like uh, where the catalysts are legitimately just tiny people with like laser swords, just like <laughs> separating molecules. And then from the future, they send back. So it is like Ant-Man, like from the future, they send back people to to steal carbon dioxide um, and, and <laughs> drink down to those same molecular levels. And it's like Star Wars meets Ant-Man, but directed by Christopher Nolan. Oh man, that's, that's oh, it. it. Written by Kevin Smith, of course. <laughs> of course. We tribute Schmodown's own Kevin Smith. <laughs> He's a little busy working on Clerks 3, I believe. But there's an idea there. Never for say certain. never. And guys, if you thought that this show couldn't get silly enough, let's move on to our special segment of the week. What a load of crap. Why do wombats poop cubes? Well, scientists might finally have an answer for years actually scientists have been wondering why wombat poop is cube shape yes really as the article puts in parentheses which i appreciate now they say that they've gotten to the bottom of this <laughs> history bare-nosed wombats or common wombats i didn't realize there were different types of wombats i'm learning something new today can be found in the woodlands of hilly landscapes in south and southeastern australia and in tasmania uh the fury marsupials are renowned renowned for producing distinctive cuboid poop which researchers believe that they can that that, that they then disperse tactically in order to communicate with one another um that's a lot to unpack now scientists at the university of tasmania have discovered more of this curious phenomenon um so yeah wombat poop guys uh johnny i know you're super excited to also get to the bottom of this mystery um uh, let's throw it over to you first what was your overall impressions from this article and as i just learned uh, a few new things about wombats. Uh, was there anything that you took away for the first time in this article where you're like, wow, I didn't know that. I'm glad you asked, Brandon. I'm very, uh, I think this article enlightened me in ways that, uh, <laughs> that many, that only how to train your dragon ever has. And, uh, I think, um, 
for one, I knew wombats existed. I had no idea what they were. And I never knew about wombat poops being cubed. So this is all just new information to me. But it's all fascinating information. I, I, I do love when, uh, when scientists spend time uh, un unraveling information about uh, things that come out of marsupial butts. Um, much like uh, a, a, a while ago when it, it went viral on TikTok, that vanilla flavoring and vanilla scents come from a goo that that is uh, it comes off of a beaver's ass, a butt. Um, <laughs> and it's like a goo that comes off of beaver butts. And that's how they make vanilla flavoring and scents. Um, that that like like I love I love poop science. And um, what what intrigued me the most about about this article, uh, because they, they link to the initial research that scientists did on uh, on, I, I believe, uh, a small blog called Soft Matter. Um, and they showed the actual like mathematical diagram that uh, that the scientists used to determine not not why, but how wombats poop cubes. <laughs> and it's so fascinating that scientists through mathematical probability, through understanding pressure, volume uh, and and time, learn that wombats, mold these poops in their really i think it's like 33 feet long intestines and and just let them out and 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 that they're using them to communicate but what are they saying to each other it raises questions it answers questions and all around i i'm excited um and especially knowing we have uh, alex alex the uh, self-proclaimed math boy here um, i'm excited about all the mathematical stuff that has to do with this for no reason I'm I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm just learning everything today. Awesome. I'm absolutely <laughs> loving your excitement about this topic. Yeah, um, like you said, the wombat's intestines are 33 feet long, which is about 10 times the length of their length of their bodies. Um, and it says here using laboratory testing and mathematical models, like you just pointed out, a team of researchers found that there are two stiff and two flexible areas around the circumference of the wombat intestines. Um, and uh, the research found that these cubes are formed within the last 17% of the colon intestine. So like you said, they've used mathematics to, to figure out, to pinpoint exactly where the poops become cubed. Um, they, they also say that the distinctive cube shape of the wombat poop is caused by, as a result of the drying of the feces in the colon and muscular contractions um, a combination of the two. So there's there's um, some contractions going on, duration within the colon, uh, apparently even uh, the humidity of in <laughs> of the inside of the colon. So they're there's like and and now they're communicating with them as well. Like you said, it raises a lot of questions. Alex, let's go over to you next. Um, did this article raise any particular questions for you? And just how excited are you about the implications of wombat poop? Well, I'm just glad that I'm not the only mammal that communicates with poop. <laughs> uh, but no, it's really cool to see, like, to think that they are super unique in the animal kingdom. Like, no, no other animal does this. And... Uh, I'm, that's just very cool. It's just a very odd thing that it's okay. Wombats, you get the, you get the, you get the cube poop. It's like, all right, thanks. Uh, the but joining me on my screen is the the band the Wombats. Oh, holding a wombat. Um, I've been a big fan of their music. Uh, so I wonder if the band poops cubes. I doubt they do because they are also humans like us. But oh, uh, oh are, yeah. <laughs> If so, then man, they make some good music. But what if the music that they make is the metaphorical cubed poop, and that is how they've been communicating? That's why they're unique. I time. see. <laughs> uh, I mean, wow, incredible! <laughs> yeah, this man, is this you, you get into layers on this show. Yeah, this is deep. <laughs> we deep go, cut. we go deep. Um, yeah, so like you said, Johnny, they are using these cubed poops of theirs, uh, placing it at points um, 
on the the what what was that they they specifically like rocks and like on their home base yeah 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 um on rocks home <laughs> home range home tactical base. areas i just love the yeah. use of the word tactical it's tactical <laughs> is what this article it's, it's yeah it's <laughs> I, okay can we can we just like can we all like pitch like what do we think what do we yeah. think they're saying to each other what do, what do you think that this is like like I just mm. want to know. Is it like, I wonder if it's like a romantic thing. Like, hey, my mm. poop's the biggest. Like, you know how like peacocks or, you know, some of the birds, they're like, they show their colors and stuff for mating. I wonder if this is a mating thing, you know, just the fecal fecal mating. That's interesting. That's a weird phrase to say. <laughs> it could be a mating thing. You know, well, I mean, have you ever had like some like bro friends in like high school who like, you know, were like, yo, did you like, see the size of the poop that i just took the other day oh yeah no uh, i i definitely i was on a uh i was on a trip with some of my friends uh a, a while ago um uh <laughs> to 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 a place and uh, when we were when we were at a rest stop there was uh two stalls and we played a game called uh battle ships but the p and the was replaced with a t and we uh it, it was a contest to see who could poop the loudest and um Oh my goodness. Uh, it, so it could totally just be like a cocky thing. Like wombats are like, I'm a better wombat than you. Watch me. <laughs> my poop. It's like whoever has the biggest poop square, poop cube, um, wins. Poop cube, a pube. So it's like a, like a dominance <laughs> Thank you. thing, perhaps. It could be dominance. It could okay. be mating. Hmm. That's it. it could be a form of art. It could just be, Ooh. it could be like, they're their Legos, you know, I, as a big Lego connoisseur, as you can see, um, I, uh, I, I believe it could just be that they're tactically placing these poops, but that they're going to then combine the poops to form a giant wombat structure um, <laughs> that <laughs> that uh, to to, you know, like a Trojan horse type of situation or like a Voltron like, kind of thing where <laughs> it's a. <laughs> wombat poop like monster. wombat power rangers or something you know like <laughs> yeah there's there's certainly a lot to unravel there a lot to to unpack guys let us know in the comment section down below what do you think these wombats are saying with their poop what are these tactical tactic are they like planning and it's, it's tactical like that means that means they're thinking about it yeah they're, I mean, the scientists watched a wombat poop and then pick it up and moved it to a specific place. And looked the scientists like in bit. the eyes as they were doing it. They're like, yeah, and you nodding. You know what I'm about. Yeah. Yeah. And then Christopher yeah. Nolan yeah. says, wow, I really saw these wombats move in their poop in a tactical formation. So that's how I came up with Tenet. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually the wombats from the future. <laughs> um, yeah putting the idea yeah exactly yeah. Mm -hmm. that's amazing oh my yeah. god i would love if you like if you get an aerial view of like southeastern australia or tasmania all the poops just form some sort of like crop symbol like it's it's like a it's like legitimately a message that's like oh man that's that that'd be amazing <laughs> uh, <laughs> lots the lots to think about there guys but i think um I was really trying to think of a poop pun, but I just draw it a blank. So let's just say, you know, it was really wonderful having the both of you here uh, with me today. Uh, it's, you know, poop is the end of the life cycle of food. So this is the end of your short time on this show today. All right. It was, uh, was it's a long awesome. road. What you got there? Yeah, yeah. You did it. It's, I'm you not did it with good role. hair, great glasses. Oh, we're all wearing glasses. Look at that. Hey, glasses, boys. <laughs> the positive glasses, boys. <laughs> Whoa, I just realized that. Well, thank you guys so much for being here today. Uh, thank you so much for complimenting my hair. Anytime. Kind of <laughs> brief, brief interruption on the show here, guys. That's okay. Uh, thank you so much for complimenting my hair, even though it is absolutely out of control. Um, Oh no, my God! Alexa is literally talking to me right now, guys. Oh. This is this has gone uh -oh. off the rails. Alex, where can the good uh -oh. people find you online? 
Uh, you can find me right here at Alex Marzona on Twitter. I just put out a lyric video for one of my songs, so the link is in there. So check that out. Oh, there you go. Um, and uh, Alexa is still talking. Robot lady, <laughs> please stop talking. Uh <laughs> it's the wombats trying to communicate to you. Oh my God. like stop talking about what we're doing. <laughs> stop talking about our secrets. <laughs> That's it. Um, Johnny, thank you so much for joining us here for the first time. It was so great having thank you. you. Having I know me. you have some stuff to plug, so please plug away. Where can the people find you online and what are you up to? Um, at it's Johnny Rome on Twitter. Uh also TikTok. I've been having a lot of fun making TikToks and uh and and stuff um and uh oh the first few podcast is coming back we're a podcast we talk about we promote diversity in life we we talk to bipoc guests uh promote their creative ventures business ventures talk about being bipoc um it, it's all very important geeks of color and um yeah uh all that awesome and i am brandon hannah of course you can find me on twitter and instagram at Brandon Hanna 07. And of course, if you're watching us here, you've already found my YouTube channel, guys. So please, once again, hit that like button, subscribe, hit that notification bell and all that stuff because we're going to be bringing science to you every single week. So with that being said, guys, I'm going to close this show out the same way I close it out every single week. And that is by saying thank you for taking time